So I just want to start by saying thank you to the organizers for inviting me here to talk. It's my first time in India and it's really exciting and um, uh, I can't wait to come back. Um, so the gap, when I was asked to think about the gap, uh, it made me think about the spaces between things and how they're often misunderstood or undervalued. When you think about gaps in the physical world, um, things aren't always what they seem. I read somewhere that if an atom was the size of your fist, the next atom along would be over a football pitch away in terms of distance. So it seems like the more you zoom into uh, physical things, um, there's more space and, and less matter. In fact, most things that bind our universe together um, are invisible. You know, magnetism, gravity, and dark energy, and all that mysterious stuff. So, I believe everything is connected in some way, um, and not just in the physical world. Ideas, for example, um, I don't think there is anything such as a, a, a completely original idea. Um, you know, I think creativity is an iterative process. We're often bounded by the technology we use, or ideas and cultures that preceded us. Now, I'm not su suggesting it's okay to imitate, but it is okay to be influenced. You know, in fact, it's impossible not to be. I guess it's a human uh, condition to separate things, label them, and put them into boxes to better understand the world. Um, but I believe things shouldn't always be that black and white. And, and that it's important to challenge the status quo and, and actively explore the gaps. So with this in mind, I will take you uh, through some of our work and I will show you how uh, we work in what I call the transitional space, um, the space between traditional uh, fields of art and design. I'll show you how our concepts are, um, and processes are iterated and how ideas are evolved and they're put in completely different um, contexts. Uh, when I started UVA 15 years ago, I knew the work that I wanted to make would mean I'd, I, I needed to create a collaborative environment, a place where people from different backgrounds and disciplines could come together and, and share knowledge and ideas. There's currently seven of us in the studio at the moment. It's been much bigger and more diverse in the past, but there's seven people now. There's an architect, programmer, maker, engineer, interaction designer, and me. I'm not sure why Sarah looks so miserable. I think she was having an off day. Um, but we work from this studio in southeast London, and my studio is very much a, a space for making and experimentation. We try to make everything ourselves. We only outsource uh, large-scale um, fabrication projects to yeah, outside sources. And we explore the, the, both the digital and the physical mediums in parallel. And I believe it's important not to be limited by technology. If there isn't a tool for the job, we make it ourselves. Our works can be small, and self-initiated for the gallery space as part of group shows, and we have a solo show coming up in New York. It's very exciting. Um, temporary commissions for museums and institutions, and we have a number of works that tour and are presented in, in public spaces. And there's also uh, permanent artworks that are more architectural in their nature. We have a long history of performative projects for the stage, dance, music-led projects, and I'll, I'll take you through some of these in, the middle, in a minute. So where did um, this curiosity begin to work in the gaps, you know, the space between things? It started when I was at college. I, I did a really strange course. They, they stopped it after three years because it messed with people's minds, but you chose a fine art subject and a design subject and, and, and did them in parallel. So I spent the first half of the week learning about typography in the communication design department, and the second half of the week uh, considering three-dimensional space in the sculpture studio. And when I left college, I was really concerned that, um, uh, that my education was a mistake, I should have focused on one thing, um, and, and I spent a couple of years freelancing, and mainly doing design projects, because I didn't feel like I could support myself as an artist. Um, and I love design, you know, I love design. Um, um, but I found myself working in the live performance industry, designing shows for, for performing artists in the music industry. In 2003, I had the opportunity to work with a band called Massive Attack. Does everyone know who Massive Attack is? Yes, oh, that, that's interesting. They, they did the theme tune to the House 
TV series, if, 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 if that um, reminds you of anything. This is the first project I did under the name of uh, UVA. And I, I did this project with the two other co-founders who have now moved on to do other things. One was a computer scientist, the other person was more of an engineer. And it was very unusual at the time to mix these different skill sets at the, at, at the beginning of a creative process. But you'll see now from you know, a lot of the talks, it's, it's quite a common practice, which is great. It consisted of a huge monolithic information display, display but there was no imagery like you see in most of these shows. It was all text, um, statistics, and numerical sort of information. The show was themed around both the positive and the negative aspects of living in an information age. And this was before social media. Uh, and it, it, the backdrop that is a, as a kind of window to information, misinformation, and disinformation. The idea was to create a brand new show every day uh, uh, using information from the internet to localize each show. So every show is different. And it was a barrage of serious political narratives juxtaposed with mundane um, information such as the local airport um, uh, live uh, timetable. And again, this was to highlight both the empowering and the debilitating aspects of um, living in a, an information age. We've designed 10 tours with the band, iterating um, uh, concepts and physical designs. And we often uh, broadcast our own fake news, and, and fake news seems to be very popular right now. But it's in no way is new. Um, uh, back in 1835, the New York Sun published a series of articles about the discovery of life on the moon. And it was a hoax story. It was sent in to the paper by a well-known astronomer called Sir John Herschel. And, he, and they reported bizarre life forms inhabiting the moon along with these fantastical pictures. And everyone believed it because he was a scientist, right? You don't question scientists. This is probably one of the most um, famous Photoshop um, images of all time. It's the Iranian um, missile launch back in 2008. Our fake news is mostly computer generated. We created an algorithm to, uh, you can turn it up a tiny bit, uh, to create, we created an algorithm that randomly se selected news headlines from the internet, from serious news to the tabloids, and it recombines them live. We have no idea what it's gonna say. Sometimes it's complete nonsense, and other times it kind of makes sense. But because it's taken from that very day, it sort of resonates with people. And it, and it, it sort of sets me true. So the scary thing is that. That show was five years ago. Could have been yesterday, right? Um, the idea of an algorithm co-authoring an artwork led to um, a permanent artwork in London. This is titled Message from the Unseen World. It's a 22 meter long public artwork situa situated in the um, Paddington Basin. And it's a homage to the life and work of the mathematician Alan Turing, who was born in Paddington. Um, in 1950, Alan Turing famously wrote this essay, um, Computing Machinery and Intelligence. And in this essay, the fundamental question he asks, is it possible for machines to think? And this, this is obviously the birth of all the AI that we know today. And we asked, if, if it's pos possible for machines to think, it, will it be possible for them to make art? Or is art the fund of, fund of one of the fundamental things that makes us human? So my idea was to create this um, this wall of words that suggested a kind of poetry, half made by man, half made by machine. And it was situated right next to the train station, so I wanted it to be reminiscent of a sort of tra train type table sign. And it co constantly updates itself. For the physical design, we took Alan's essay and encrypted it, uh, hard-coded it into the, into the surface here, using the BODOC code, which was uh, a form of communication in the 1950s. The hard-coded fascia uh, acts as, as an aperture to light, let light through, and we used light to create a dynamic text layer. We commissioned a poet, um, Nick Drake, to write a poem about the life and work of Alan Turing, 
And this is just a tiny section of it. And, and again, we use that algorithm to generate alternative lines that would take, and, and we use the essay as a dictionary for, for that extra content. So it, it kind of ended up, ended up being like a living poem that you would walk past, constantly changing, constantly evolving. And uh, you didn't know what was written by man, what was written by machine. And uh, to this day it runs and it's never ever the same. And there's spaces in it so that when you walk past, it's easier to read. The idea of a, um, the idea evolved into a series of um, wall sculptures titled the etymologies. And again, these are dynamic text pictures that evolve perpetually. And they come in a series, diff different physical shapes um, affects the way that the words transition and, and the content is, is read. It was influenced by these early um, concrete po poetry pictures from the 1960s. These are by um, Carl Andre, and, and uh, they don't move, but they have this lovely computational quality. And each book uses its own uh, each artwork uses its own book as a dictionary. Uh, themes of consciousness, memory, time, and the, and the, and these books are used as a database to, to create these entirely new. Um, compositions of text. And again, sometimes it's nonsensical, but every now and then it, it suggests um, a sort of a poem. And again, it's in a constant state of transition. So I wanted to show you those works because it demonstrates how ideas can start on a stage, end up as a public artwork, and then on a gallery wall. And, and it doesn't have to start small and get big, it can be the other way around. Our work Blueprint is another work that's in a constant state of transition. Um, we were commissioned by the Philadelphia Science Center to create an artwork for their waiting room. And Philadelphia Science Center, they, they kind of research genetics, but they also do operations, um, this weird mix of research and operation. And so for the, for the post-operation room, they wanted an artwork and uh, to create some a calming atmosphere for the space. So the idea started looking uh, at evolutionary uh, visualizations. You know, only in recent years has it been possible to visualize these systems with some accuracy. This is actually by um, uh, a guy called Leonard Eisenberg, and it illustrates 3.5 billion years on Earth. And we are right at the end there, a tiny little tip. Um, and one questions how much further that will go with our current state of affairs. I like the idea of creating a living artwork that evolved and was never the same. Um, I wanted to create a work that was meditative and had the feeling of an impressionist painting. Uh, so we developed a script that uh, um, grew these animations across a digital canvas. And the animations were driven by what we call virtual seeds. Each seed has a particular um, set of genetic qualities. And this determines their strength, color, growth rate little animation. This is uh, just early animation. We um, plant the seeds across the uh, canvas and then they fight for survival. Um, some colors more dominant than others and, and some plants die. And we could have just displayed this on the screen and that would have been a lot e easier but I wanted a strong uh, sculptural aspect to the work and, and the light emission was potentially therapeutic. Uh, the sculpture itself is um, made of a grid of light cells, and it's reminiscent of a DNA um, sequence. Each light cell has an LED that's diffused, and the code is applied to the sculpture. And the animation is very slow. It takes about 20 minutes for this, for this um, uh, uh, composition to evolve. I'll just show you some movie. This first shot shows some, scal some scales. It was about three meters high. And from this point, it's sped up to show you what happens over a long period of time, longer period of time. And we actually um, had to put a camera in the waiting room because we had no idea what it would look like after six months. It worried it looked terrible, but we haven't had to press this reset button, and it's been there for a couple of years. Um, okay, so it's interesting. A couple of the previous presenters are talking about time, and there's a number of artworks. Um, that we've made that investigate our experience of time. This is work titled Our Time, and it's uh, an installation designed to challenge our perception of time and, and make a space for contemplation. And, and 
the idea really started with a simple debate in the studio with the question, you know, how long is a second? Um, anyone know how long a second is? Well, apparently it's this. It's, um, this is my most accurate to date sort of recording of time, which is over 9 billion oscillations of an atom in an atomic clock. So the question is, is time then something in of itself, or is it simply the measurement of change, whether it be the sun's position or the vibration of an ap atom? I also read somewhere that according to our digital lives, that our experience of time is actually getting faster, that our brains are actually being rewired uh, to experience time faster. So if this is true, is time something we actually feel and, it, and maybe it's something in, it, in of itself? And, th and this is a question that it seems a lot of philosophers have been struggling with for many centuries and no one's actually come up with a, with a definitive answer. So time is something that's very difficult to put into words, but you feel it. So with these questions in, in mind, I thought, is it possible to change someone's perception of time and re reverse this phenomenon and, and make a space for contemplation? And the pendulum is a symbolic reference of time, so it seemed like a good mechanism for the basis of an artwork. Before I uh, show you some moving image of this, this work, I should show you a little bit of the design process because it's, it, 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 was, it was a massive challenge. We base the design on the Fuku pendulum, which is a simple ball on a string. You see them in science museums in, um, in Europe. And, and they're very old, and they swing on two axes, and they essentially visualize the Earth's rotation and, and, and uh, both time and gravity. So we set about making our own Fuku pendulums, and it starts like this, um, little maquettes out of wood, with a double gimbal system, moving up to slightly larger uh, mechanisms with electromechanical control and then you go to steel and to have absolute control over a mechanical pendulum you know you're, you're really fighting physics on all level even if the, the end point is very light a little movie of our first pendulum moving so we had to have two huge stepper motors just to move one kilo kilogram of weight at the end of the, the pole and stop it in space. Someone's very impressed with the, with the results there. Um, we could just about Focus. get this into our um, studio. I didn't quite get it right at this point. And, and the work, each pendulum has its own light source and sound source, which accentuate the, the movement. And it looks super minimal, but we have to pack in all of this uh, stuff to this very lightweight. Um, a minimalistic looking form. And we do this all ourselves in, in the studio. Uh, and then a 3D visualization program is developed to help us get a sense of space because when you're working on these large scale projects, you get very, very little time to set it up, let alone live with it for a bit and program it. So you have to get a sense of space and, 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 and movement, etc. So let's look at some video. This is it dark on the screen? Can you? So the pendulums are programmed to be in a constantly evolving um, uh, sequence. Uh, There's it's kind of no beginning or no end. And they start off in time in unison. And then over time, they all start swinging slightly differently, different time periods. And you can walk into this, so you're underneath it. And not only is it projecting light, it's projecting sound. Every now and then, an anomaly would happen like this. It's like a gravitational pull in, in, in the room and um, it's very strange it really affects your process of inference your body isn't expecting what your eyes are, are looking at now it would be very easy to uh, do lots of stuff with, with these um, robots essentially you have to resist that temptation and then let these different uh, properties uh, emerge over time.
very difficult to... Um... Thank you. It's very difficult to communicate what it feels like. You know, our works are meant to be experienced and, and uh, it's very two-dimensional here. But you get the idea. So our pendulum works are usually standalone pieces, um, but we did use them for a performative work at the Paris Opera. Our time suggested a performance of sorts. Um, it was like watching a kind of mechanical choreography. So it felt logical to use them on the stage. We were invited by Benjamin Mapilliard uh, on your right here with his team. Uh, he, he was the artistic director of the National Opera of Paris. He, he wanted us to design his inaugural show. Um, he referenced uh, these early 17th century Baroque uh, dance sequences for his choreography. And after a bit of research, it was really interesting that this design philosophy permeated not only musical score, dance, but also garden design and, and architecture. So I like the idea of creating something that was sort of really holistic, that um, almost turned the, the stage into a performer itself, and not just a simple backdrop. In addition to the three pendulums, um, I, we created what I call virtual lights. We didn't use any traditional lights. We created this illusion by uh, adding projection, back projecting into our architecture, and it, it created the illusion of these pendulums projecting light. And this al allowed us to create these very dynamic um, uh, scenes in an instant that would be very difficult to do with tr traditional lights. There were three different performances a night, and, and ours was one of them, and so we had to erect the projection screens, um, hang the pendulums, map the projectors in 30 minutes. It's a bit of a military operation. So let's look a bit of moving image. I've sped this up just so that you can turn it up. See more of the performance, otherwise you wouldn't see much going on.
So I've made you watch all of that so you can go home and not only say that you've been to a great design conference, but you've seen a whole Paris Opera ballet performance, right? Um, so you can see how our installation can lead to a performative one. And, but some of our projects are even kind of harder to define and, and perhaps they transcend any traditional definition. This is Musica Universalis and it's, I kind of, I, I, I call it a performing um, installation, a kind of spatial instrument. And it started reading about the ideas of Pythagoras and uh, he was one of the first ever Greek philosophers and he discovered that there was a price relation between the pitch of a musical note and the length of a string, which seems ob obvious to us now, but this, this discovery was a giant leap in the understand, understanding of the science of sound. Um, he then went a step further and suggested that the mathematical proportions of movements of the celestial bodies of the sun, the moon, the planets, they call, uh, form a kind of inaudible music. Uh, and he called this music a universalist. Unfortunately, that didn't turn out to be true. Um, whilst on Earth, a lot of his great work was, was proved to be true. Um, the, the movements of our major planets in our solar system do not equate to these harmonious patterns. There are, however, thousands of dwarf planets on the edges of our solar system that we know very little about, but we do know the way that they move. And there's one particular little cluster, uh, which you can see in a visualization on the right, that have this very peculiar harmoni harmonious um, relationship. So we thought, why don't we take this information and make our own Musica Universalis and, and, and make a performance based on this, the data that we know. So this is quite a recent project. Um, I haven't done a proper documentation of it. Can you turn it down a bit? Um, but it consists of um, eight kinetic mobiles with a light and a sound source. The light represents the dwarf planet and the spheres represents the sun's position. And there's a speaker on the other side that sonifies the resonant patterns. Again, this work would take an hour to go through a complete cycle. So it's just a little bit of moving image to show you what that looks like. Um, so you may have noticed a lot of our work uses light and sound. And, and, and you might ask, why light? Um, well, I think it's one of the most magical mediums there is. Um, it's one of the only me mediums that creates a feeling in of itself, a bit like sound and music. So it's an incredibly emotive um, material. Um, and I created this work uh, just because I was sitting in the bath one day and that the light was coming through the window and dappling on, these, on the blinds and it just is incredibly beautiful. Um, and I thought, why is that? Why, you know, if that was an image, it, it wouldn't be so emotive. So I decided to try and create my own suspended reality and, and, and created this artwork. I guess the artwork's also a sort of metaphor for our increasingly mediated reality through screens, through windows. Okay, so. Oh, wrong way. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a recent project called Spirit of the City. And that this is a project that uh, we had in New York through the whole summer. And this time, no artificial light is used, um, we, we, but we're harnessing daylight to disrupt space. Um, it's a site-specific installation in the courtyard of the ADO gallery. And I guess this comes as close um, to a commercial sort of uh, relationship uh, out of most of our work. The, the, this space is actually owned by the BMW group, but they have no cars in it. You know, it's a, quite an interesting space. They have a gallery, a cafe, a cafe, and and a, and a sort of uh, a work shared workspace. But every year they commission a work for the courtyard. Last year was Assemble, and now I think uh, Studio Swine are doing it. 
And they had a brief, and the brief was to make a work that um, uh, responded to the New York City in some way. So our idea was to um, uh, make something that um, explored the physical and the emotional aspects of navigating a city, and in particular, New York City for the first time. Early research took us to this book by Kevin Lynch from the 1960s. Lynch's conclusion was that people form mem mental maps of their surroundings consisting of five be uh, basic elements, nose, edges, paths, landmarks, districts. Sorry. But this also made me think about our ability to make mental maps. You know, technology is, is allowing us to um, quickly access uh, maps and, and uh, I noticed this when I was in Shanghai recently. I went um, to Shanghai, I w went to go and see a couple of monuments and I got lost and I went to my phone. I realized that Google doesn't work in, in China so I couldn't use my Google Maps and I got lost pretty quickly and I, I didn't have that sense of anxiety for about 10 years um, but I, I ended up in some amazing places that I would never have gone to otherwise. So the question is, does efficiency of technology mean that uh, we lose certain aspects of experience? In the 1960s, the artist movement, the situationists, believed in disrupting maps. They encouraged disrupting routine as a source of inspiration. They thought you should intentionally get lost, take yourself out of your comfort zone. Um, and then there's lots of artists that have uh, tried to represent the, the, the energy of New York uh, over time. I love this painting, it's by Mondrian, it's called Broadway Boogie Woogie. It's, it's just an awesome title. And <clears throat> apparently it's a stud, uh, study of dynamic rhythm, a description of the work reads, uh, stuttering chromatic pulses create paths across the canvas, suggesting the city's grid and the movement of traffic and blinking of electric lights, as well as the sound rhythms of jazz. Now, I don't know if that would have come into my mind when, uh, when I looked at this painting, but it's amazing that this can be the inspiration for such an abstract artwork. The photographer Ernst Hans uh, made some great imagery of New York City. Um, this was in 1970, before Photoshop existed. Uh, he bridged the gap between photojournalism and uh, photography as a medium ex of expression. This is another picture of him. And what I really liked is this idea of fragmented reality, uh, this idea that the city moves around you as you move it uh, through it. This isn't New York, but um, th this is by the French impressionist uh, Claude Monet. Monet and he, he uh, tried to capture light at different times of the day, different times of the year from the ruined cathedral. Um, so. Yeah, light can cr uh, create very different uh, feeling of a painting. This is a satellite image of New York. Um, what I love about this image is, is that it looks like a kind of living organism and how scale, from a certain scale, something uh, man-made can look completely organic. When you zoom in, it starts to become difficult that you're a part of much, something much bigger. And time, time reveals the patterns of human activity. Um, one way to understand the pulse of a city is by looking at information. ADO presented all of these statistics um, about you know, uh, the energy consumption, the flow of information. It turns out there's many different types of rush hours. The internet rush hour is very different to the traffic one. So I was interested in using information as a part of the, the artwork, but I didn't want to make a sort of dry, unemotional data visualization project. I wanted to express the life of the city through um, you know, geometry, light, shadow, movement. We explored different material types to create a contrast to the building. And then we added electromechanical control to um, our sculptural forms. We fed the data into the sculpture to make it move, and there's a little bit of moving image. So the work and space are in a constant transition through light movement. People are allowed to walk in into the middle of this installation. You see yourself in front of yourself, behind yourself, and it's, it's really disorientating but exciting at the same time, much like navigating a city for the first time. 
And also, you know, this, this sense of, well, when you go to somewhere in New York for the first time, all of this glass and these towers, you feel alienated, but you feel included. You, it has this inclusivity. So you have all, the, all of these juxtaposing feelings. So when it's quiet in the day in New York, this is all in unison, moving really slowly. If the city is busy, it starts to get cacophonous. All right, so it's been a really long weekend. That gives you a kind of idea of what we do, and I'm going to leave it there and happy to take some questions.